All right, welcome back, everyone. So first in this session will be Senna. So please take it away. Thanks. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Senna Tavares. I'm a PhD a student at MIT. And today I'm going to talk about some work on causal and probabilistic inference in a library we've got called Omega. And so this talk's roughly divided into three parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about conditional inference. So can I just get a show of hand if you know what conditional inference is or posterior inference? OK, great. And the second part is about causal inference. And this is about interventions, about causality. So again, can I get a show of hands if you know what causal inference is or the do operator? Great. And the last part is about higher order inference using something called the random conditional distribution. And so again, can I get a show of hands if you know about the random conditional distribution? So here I shouldn't really see any hands because we just submitted a paper on this last week. So <laughs> <laughs> that means you must be my reviewer or my friend. Um, so the first part, conditional inference. So an example which really brought home this idea to me, I saw in the start of my start of graduate school, simple, simple example. So before I came here, um, I went to my drawer at home and I pulled out a coin and I flipped the coin a bunch of times. So I flipped the coin once and I got heads, and I got heads again when I flipped it again, and then heads, and then I got a whole series of heads. Right? Um, and so when you see the sequence, you may be suspicious. You may think that I didn't actually flip this coin and I, I just wrote this down in the document. Um, <laughs> but I, I went to my drawer again, I got a different coin and I flipped it and I got heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. And again, you may see this sequence and you may think this is kind of suspicious. Um, but this third sequence from my, from my third draw, uh, heads, tails, 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 heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, heads. That seems kind of reasonable. Um, but this is kind of strange, right? It's strange because assuming the coin is fair, each of these sequences is equally likely. Right? So why is it that the first two make us feel suspicious and the last one seems reasonable? And so I think the answer goes down to this assumption, assuming the coin is fair. So this assumption is false, that we, we don't assume the coin is fair. We have a belief over whether the coin is fair. And so the, the probabilistic approach, or the, or the Bayesian approach, as people call it sometimes, is to have beliefs over everything. We, sh we, can ne we should never be too sure about anything. So let's model this as an omega program. So in omega, you uh, define distributions. And so in this case, we're going to model the coin as a Bernoulli distribution, which is just going to be true or false with some probability. And this weight, rather than being a constant value, is going to be uniformly distributed. So this says it could be anything between 0 and 1, and all of these things are equally likely. And now our data is just a, a sequence of, of coin flips. And here's our condition. So this is saying we want to condition or create this condition which says our flips is equal to our data. Right. And finally, this posterior distribution, this posterior random variable, uh, is made using this cond construct, right? which says, you should understand it says, I want to find the conditional distribution of the weight given my condition. So given that I've observed these coin tosses. OK, so here's our model. This is a valid omega program. And let's look at what happens. So here I have this uniform prior that I showed you before in code. But now we've got a histogram. And I'm also showing you two different priors. So one prior is just a basic distribution. right? It's symmetric around 0 0.5. And the other prior is this constant. This is a, kind of the assumption that um, the coin is, is fair. Right? And so it's a kind of degenerate distribution. It's always 0 0.5. So after I observe one coin toss, my posterior distribution, my belief about the weight of the coin changes dramatically. Right? So before, in the uniform case, I've gone from being uniform to now this kind of triangular distribution. In the beta case, I've shifted slightly to the left-hand side. Um, and the constant distribution hasn't changed. So if I repeat this, I observe uh, another tails, actually. Two, more, two tails and, 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 sorry, three and four tails. And so as we increase the number of tails that we're observing, we become increasingly, uh, we increase our belief that the coin is basically biased. And so there's a few points which I think are really interesting here. And probability theory has a kind of reputation for being confusing and having many paradoxes, but I think there's a, a few key, key ideas. One key idea is that the posterior distribution is unique. It uniquely says, Given this information I had before and some new information, what should I believe now? So this is in contrast to some other machine learning methods where there could be many solutions, or maybe even the optimal solution isn't the one you want. Here, there's a unique way to reason, and this is a very elegant thing about uh, the Bayesian approach. And the second thing to note is that this constant prior doesn't change. And what this means is that we should always be uncertain, because if we're not uncertain about things, we can never really update our beliefs in light of evidence. 
Okay, so let's see how this is implemented. So the model I showed you before was actually a kind of sugar, syntactic sugar, on top of something which is a little bit more explicit and more primitive. And so the way that we can describe this random variable, describe this process, is by basically using this RAND construct. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with RAND in Julia. If you give it no arguments, it just gives you a value between zero and one, right? But you can also pass in this global, or sorry, you can also pass in this uh, random number generator object as the first argument, just in normal Julia. And if you don't pass in this object, it's kind of taken from this kind of hidden in the background, right? But you can always pass in this RNG. And so what we're gonna do is define weight as just something which calls random RNG. And Bernoulli, which takes RNG, applies weight to it, and then checks whether this is greater than some other random number, right? And so the intuition here is that if the weight is very high, this, e this inequality is gonna be true most of the time. Flips just does a bunch of flips, right? Repeats this process a number of times. And now what does it mean to condition? Um, well, a condition is also a random variable. It takes in the RNG, sends it to flip. The result of that is gonna be a Boolean vector. And then we check whether that's equal to our data, right? So the result of passing a, an RNG to this function uh, condition will be true or false. Our condition is satisfied or it's not satisfied. And so this posterior, this is a bit of a strange one. Um, and it's slightly pseudocode, but the idea here is that uh, we're gonna check whether our condition's satisfied, right? We're gonna pass RNG to condition, and if it is, we're gonna apply the RNG to the weight. So basically, you wanna find the, the state of the RNG which made our condition true, all right? And then we wanna find the, the weight that corresponds to that. And otherwise, we're gonna throw an error. So here's our, here's our model in explicit form. And, there's a, but there's a few issues here. One, if you look at the Bernoullis, they all call um, weight, right? And so the result here is that it's like, instead of flipping one coin several times, I'm, I'm flipping several different coins, which is not what we want. And the second thing that's wrong is that the state of the RNG in this posterior part is not captured, right? When I, when I do condition RNG and then, I, and then I apply weight to RNG, I haven't captured the state of the RNG. And so basically, what I'm gonna show you here is in, in, in the next slide is one side will be the most code that we'll see in the rest of the presentation, which is how Omega works internally. So in Omega, this is gonna be Mini Omega in one slide. Right? And so in Omega, Mini Omega, we define this module, Mini Omega, and we're gonna define Omega as a subtype of RNG. So basically, we're gonna hack into the RNG system. And the high level idea here is that rather than just spit out a random number, we're gonna track in the execution of a random variable um, where we are, and this allows us to basically make the random variable very repeatable, so that if I apply some omega to the same random variable twice, I get the same answer. So the random variable will be a pure function of its input. Um, so a rand var is just a, a very thin wrapper around a function, and we have this special rule which says that if I apply some omega to a rand var, basically set this pointer to zero, and the pointer basically tracks where in the program we are. And so I'm actually decided I'm not gonna go into this part in too much detail, but the basic idea is that the, the abstract RNG, the subtype omega is like a normal omega with the exception that we store the state. So if we run this program by passing an omega to, into, into weight, for example, so just on the previous slide, we had, uh, we had weight equals rand of RNG. Now, if we pass in the same RNG, RNG twice, we're gonna get the same answer, right? And this basically solves all the issues that we had in the in, in, in that example. Okay, but let's look at a more interesting example. Yeah. Um, it seems to me, I mean, uh, this is a more serious problem is that the, the condition is never gonna be true. The condition will be true when it's satisfied. Uh, when you say posterior is the condition, uh, that condition is very, very unlikely to be true. Right? Oh, very unlikely to be true. That's a, that's a, that's a big difference between never and unlikely. Oh, sorry, yeah. But we'll get to that point. Yeah, we'll get to that point in a moment. So yeah, that's a very naive inference algorithm, and we're gonna talk about that. So let's look at a more, a more interesting example, and, and, this, and your problem will come up in, in this example. So this is a, a, a rendered image, and it's, I, I implemented this module in Julia, you can play with it, it's called Ray Trace, and it works by basically simulating light out through a scene and bouncing around light rays and, and generating an image. But the high level idea is that a renderer takes in a three-dimensional object, or a three-dimensional scene, and renders that to a two-dimensional image. Right. Um, but what we often want is to do the inverse of that process. 
to go from a two-dimensional image to a three-dimensional reconstruction. Why, for example, if we're a robot and we want to figure out what the world is from our, from our, cam from our cameras, or we think, you know, hu people think that the human mind does something like this, um, figures out the two-dimensional, three-dimensional world from two-dimensional images. So, um, what is the structure of, of, a, of a ray tracer? It's very simple, we have spheres which have these properties, a center, a radius, and so on and so on. And the scene is just a collection of spheres. And this render function takes in the scene and renders that to a 2D image. And so in the inverse direction, there's a problem. So if I go back to this image, you can't see what's behind, for example, the red ball. Um, that blue ball could be very big and very far away, or it could be very small and very close, right? Or there could be like an infinite stream of balls behind the red ball that we can't see. And so we don't know what's behind the red ball. But in the Bayesian, in the Bayesian world, in the, uh, we have to quantify our uncertainty. So we have to specify a prior belief over scenes. And so using omega, here's the prior distribution over scenes. We're just going to say uniform returns a uniform vector between uh, A and B. And then we're going to create a distribution over spheres, right? And basically this is going to create a, a sphere, and that sphere, center, radius, color, and so on and so on, will be drawn from some uniform distribution. And a scene is just a collection of spheres, right? And the number of spheres in that scene is, is decided by a Poisson distribution. So if you don't know what a Poisson is, it's just a discrete distribution that we take out when we can't think of any other discrete, discrete distribution. Um, and so, so here's our prior distribution. And let's look, what it look, let's look at what it looks like. So here are samples from the prior. Obviously, I can't show you the 3D shape because you know, we, we, we see through 2D, but the, the idea here, here is that the prior is a, on a 3D geometry. And so here are different samples. As you can see, there are different colors and different um, orientations and different sizes and so on. And so in Omega, it's very simple to, to sample, from this, uh, sample from the conditional distribution. Now we want to sample from the conditional distribution of the scene given our observation. So just to, uh, to clarify the syntax here, cond takes in a, a random variable x, in this case a scene, and a predicate y, the thing that we're trying to condition on. This is the thing that we want to be true. So in this case, we want c image, um, which just corresponds to the rendered image, our distribution over rendered images, because we have a distribution over scenes. We want that to be equal to an observed image. And in this case, the observed image is just, just going to be the, uh, the one I showed in the, in the first slide, right? And so just to, to make this very clear, we're trying to find the, the conditional distribution of the 3D scenes, given that if I were to render that scene, it would be equal to my observed image. So here's how you write, write it in Omega, and then we can just run this program, and, and as you said, we can wait forever. And the reason that we'll wait forever is that it's very unlikely that if we generate a scene, render it, that it's going to actually be equal to our observed image. Right. Um, to make this clearer, if we have a, you know, a slight detour, if we have a very simple model, x and y are both uniform, if I wanted to condition on x equals y, it defines this very thin line in, in x and y space. You know, this line here is a lot thicker than it is in reality. In reality, you know, it's one floating point number. Um, inequalities such as greater than or this other, you know, this lo other logical combination, they are you know, slightly thicker, but when you get to high dimensional problems, the rejection sampling approach, the, the, the initial algorithm I showed, is basically intractable, and so we need better ways. And so what Omega does is that we take this constraint and we turn it into a soft constraint. And so rather than be a predicate is x equal to y, we have this energy function. And this energy function says, basically, how close am I to being, how close is x, x being equal to y? Um, or in this case, it, we, we say, how close is the constraint to being satisfied, x greater than y, right? And so the idea here is that we want to take this half constraint, which is difficult to work with, and turn it into this kind of soft, nice energy function, which is smooth, and we can work with it with many different inference algorithms. And so how do we turn this hard predicate into a soft constraint? Well, the basic idea is that we take all of the operations in the language, all of the inequalities, all of the Boolean-valued functions, and we replace them with soft Boolean-valued functions, right? So rather than have equals, we basically take the distance between x and y, and then we apply a kernel to it. And so the kernel isn't so, or is important, but the idea of the kernel is just to make sure that the, that the value is between 0 and 1. Uh, and we have the same for inequalities and all the logical operators. 
And so basically by replacing the operators in your, in your program from these hard constraints, such as you know, greater than or equals to these soft, soft constraints, we turn the hard program into a, a soft program. And all of these soft, these soft constraints, they're parameterized by this temperature alpha, right? And so what this means is that if the alpha is very high, everything's good, right? All of, all of, the, all of the values satisfy my constraints, but I've changed the problem so much that it's no, no longer useful. And as I turn down the temperature, we get closer and closer to the hard constraint, but now inference becomes harder again. So there's this trade-off between how hard is inference and how much are we willing to, uh, uh, to, to approximate and change the actual problem. So there's one last point. As I said, we have to define a, a notion of distance when we use these soft constraints between objects. So what does it mean for, like, what does it mean for uh, two images to be similar? So you might say, okay, an image is a matrix or it's a, a tensor or an array. I'm just going to take the Euclidean distance between these arrays and say that's my distance. Right. The issue with, I mean, there's many issues with that. I, I think the question is, like, why would that be a good idea rather than a bad idea? But what we really want to capture is that, you know, objects are similar in kind of low-level details. For example, the, the balls are the same color and also high-level abstract details, the, the, the same number of objects and so on. And to do this, we, take a, we use a neural network. And we're using the neural network in a kind of a strange way. We're not the only ones to, to do this, I should say. Um, and the neural network you can think of as just a composition of functions. You take in some input and you apply some sequence of transformations, you get some output. And so what we do instead is that we take our two images, pass them through the same neural network, and at each stage of the network, we take out the internal representation. Right, so after layer one, after layer two, after layer three, and so we get out all these representations of these two images. And so the distance that we use is basically the distance on this internal representation space. And so this D is really the Euclidean distance. But now it's not the Euclidean distance in pixel space, it's on this internal representation space. Um, and so this is necessary to get a kind of a, a meaningful notion of distance between, uh, between images. There are other ways, but this is the way that we're trying for this example. Yeah. So in, in this case, we, I just took a pre-trained network of, of like flux or metal head or whatever. It wasn't trained on, on our data. Um, you could do that. Um, for example, you could use an autoencoder or something like that, but we, we just take a pre-trained network. And so a caveat, we haven't fully solved this, this problem. This is an ongoing research problem. But I'll show you what we can do. And so now, this, this, uh, the, the, the code that we use to conditional sample, first we define this distance, right? And so in omega, you just redefine this omega.d for two images. And I'm using this term, you know, net feature diff to describe the previous slide. And then it's the same as before. Sample ran from the conditional distribution of a scenes given that my image is equal to my observed image. And the only difference here is that I have this soft equality, equals equals you know, subjugate S, S. And so the inference algorithm I'm not really describing, but you can use a, a variety. Here I'm using a variation of Markov chain Monte Carlo. On the right-hand side is the observed image. On the left-hand side is a sequence uh, of, of samples from the distribution. And as you can see, we start off in some random point. It's not very good. And as we progress through the, the process, we get closer and closer until we end up with something which looks like the observed image. So obviously, we haven't captured all the details. We haven't captured all the reflections and so on. But we've captured the high-level geometric properties, like the objects are in roughly the right place. Um, another example, the second row doesn't work so well. We kind of get all these things overlapping. But the third example is better. It's, it's a little, little bit hard to see on this projector. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is inverse graphics, and we think it's cool because it's a very direct way to invert a renderer. We, we, we literally take a, a normal rendering algorithm and kind of run it um, with these soft constraints to, to try to invert the process. And so there's a bunch of other examples we've done. So for example, in the real world, we know that objects don't intersect, rigid objects don't intersect, but there was nothing in the prior that I set up that said that objects don't intersect. And so what you can do in Omega is basically just say objects don't intersect, right? So I'm gonna define a predicate which says for all objects, don't intersect. Add that to our conditions, and now objects don't intersect anymore. Um, and so here we're just seeing without this condition and with this condition. Also, we're just like a kind of a toy example. If I condition on them being equidistant, so you get this uh, kind of tetrahed tetrahedral shape. So in healthcare is an example that we've been working on. Um, I'm just going to show this very quickly. But the idea is that you know doctors they have very high level knowledge. For example, they just know that patients are generally similar or the expected value of, of 
of glucose over time is similar between patient A and patient B. And what we're showing here is that if you can take this information into account, if you can condition on it, um, you can train RNNs which capture the glucose levels of patients much more accurately with a very small amount of data. And you can use a very small amount of data because you have high level knowledge that people are quite similar and you can encode these constraints in omega. Okay, so that's the, the conditional inference part. And now I'm going to move on to, to the causal inference part. Um, and so there's a lot of hands went up when I talked about causal inference, but the high level idea of causal inference is to say there's a difference between association and, and causality. Um, so if I say smoking causes cancer, I can't describe this fact in a purely probabilistic framework. I need some notion of causality, not just that these things are associated. So let's go for a, a simple example of causal inference in Omega, and we think Omega is one of the first languages to support causal inference. So here's, here's, here's my bedroom. And as you can see, I've got a big AC button, which I, I use to, to turn the AC on. And I've got a window that I can open and close. And I've got a, a, a thermostat or thermometer that I can read the temperature at. And so I'm just going to define a very simple causal model. And uh, the first variable in this model is the time of day. So it could either be uh, the morning, afternoon, or the evening. And then I'm going to say, is the window open or closed? Well, it could e either, equally likely so. Is the AC on? Well, if the window is open, I'm going to be a good environmentalist and say that I'm always going to turn the AC off. Otherwise, if the window is closed, then the AC could be on or off. So what's the outside temperature? Well, it's just very uh, hot in the afternoon. It's, it's a little bit hot in the morning, and it's very cold at nighttime. And the temperature inside, if the AC is on, is 20 degrees average. Otherwise, it's just room temperature, 25 degrees. So, and lastly, what does the thermostat read? Well, the thermostat says, if the window is open, the temperature is going to be the average between the outside and the inside. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, just room temperature, right? So we have a perfect in insulation. Okay, so what we can say with Omega is, okay, what is the distribution of outside temperatures, right? And so here we just see these three peaks for the different times of day. But what I can say through conditioning is that what is the distribution over outside temperatures conditioned on the fact that I've observed that the thermostat is greater than 30? So after I've observed this, it means that it becomes very unlikely that it's either the morning or the night time. Right? This is conditional inference. But I can also say, what is the distribution of the outside temperatures if I went and I kind of hacked my thermostat? Right? And you can see the first one and the last one are not, ch are not changed, which is what you should expect. You're like, if I go and hack my thermostat, it doesn't make it more or less sunny outside. And so the key difference between interventions, causal interventions, and conditioning is that intervention changes the world. It kind of breaks the model in ways that you can't do with conditioning. And in, me in, in Omega, we do it with this replace function. And so replace A, uh, B old goes to B new, basically means that if B old is a parent of A, so basically A depends on B old, then I can create a new A, a copy of A, where B old has been replaced with B new. Right? So this is how you do interventions in Omega. OK, so, but the cool thing about causal inference is that we can ask kind of counterfactual questions. What would happen if, right? Um, and so I could ask a question, a simple question. If I were to uh, close the window and turn on the AC, would it be colder, right? So most people have the intuition, yes, probably, right? Um, and Omega kind of just matches your intuition. And so here I've got this, uh, I hope you can see, but it just says I'm going to replace the thermostat. So I'm going to create a new thermostat distribution where the AC has been forced to be on and the window has been forced to be closed. Right? And so now what I'm showing you is the difference between this kind of intervene model and the, and the, uh, the, old, and the, and the original model, right? which basically says, is it colder? And as you can see, it's, it's shifted to the left, which means in expectation, it's, it's colder. You have this big spike at zero, which just basically means that sometimes we intervene and we don't make any effect because the world is already that way, so there's no change. Um, also with intervention, we can make changes which are impossible in the model. So before I said I'm a good environmentalist, so you know, I never uh, turn the AC on when, when the window is open, right? And so I can't condition on this being true, but I can intervene on it being true. I can just force it to be true with an intervention. And when we make this intervention, uh, you, can, you can see that the, the new distribution over the thermostat or the temperature outside given this intervention. So 
this is basically the, the idea behind causal inference. Um, this is a simple example. It's a new feature, and we hope that we can you know, try some new cool things out. And so very quickly, I'm going to go for the last part, which is about higher-order inference. So to give a sense of what this means, you know, if I say, okay, um, you know, a few months ago I was here in London, I'm from London, and, uh, and everyone was saying, okay, England are going to win the World Cup. I'm certain of it, right? So you can take that fact that England are going to win, or that, that belief that in England are going to win the World Cup. This is a probabilistic statement. Like, you know, I believe England are going to win the World Cup, and I can have my own belief over beliefs. Right? I can say, okay, I'm not sure if, that, if, the, if the odds you're giving me are quite correct. Right? And so there's this idea, this question of, what does it mean to have beliefs of, over beliefs or distributions over distributions? Um, and so there, in the 80s, there was a long argument about this. Um, basically, some people said, we need a whole new uh, kind of uh, theory of, of, of uncertainty to, to deal with this case. And other people said, yeah, you're right, we need a, a whole new theory, um, but it should be like higher order, higher order probability theory. And then some other people said, no, we don't, everything's fine. And some more people said, no, we don't, everything's really fine. Right? Um, and so the, the kind of the approach that we take in Omega is we don't need a, a new kind of theory, but we do need a new language construct to support this kind of inference. Um, and so I don't have time to go into these, the technical details, but the kind of the main contribution here is this object, this mathematical object, which we call the random conditional distribution. And at a very high level, um, it allows you to take something which is certain, for example, an expectation or a belief, and turn it automatically into something which is not uncertain. And just to make this concrete, I'll show you an example in, in fairness. So um, in algorithmic fairness, we're trying to create classifiers which are fair, which don't discriminate between different groups. And one way to describe this is something called demographic parity, right? Which says that, um, you know, suppose there's a, a whole, there's a, some kind of classification, whether you get a job offer or not. And what, a, what demographic parity says is the, the probability which with, with which I get a job offer if I'm in some kind of uh, minority group versus whether I'm in just the rest of the group should be bounded by some ratio, right? Which means it shouldn't discriminate too much against uh, a particular person from a minority group. So this, this, Inequality, which I have here, is either true or false. You give me a probabilistic classifier, I tell you whether it's fair or not. It may be hard to compute, but I can tell you whether it's fair or not. So what we can do with Omega is basically say, okay, you give me your probabilistic classifier, and by kind of just adding these bars here, you can say, actually, I'm going to change your classifier such that it's fair, right? Which means find me the conditional distribution over classifiers such that this constraint of fairness is satisfied. Right? And so the magic, which I wish I had more time to go into, is to say, okay, I can take something which is either true or false and turn it into a random variable. And so the example which we have in this paper, which we just submitted, is to, to do just this. We take, a, we take a classifier, which is not fair, and we turn it into a fair one, which satisfies this constraint here. So those are three, roughly the, the, three, the three areas of, of, um, of inference. Uh, this is just a more efficient way to do this kind of random conditional distribution. But in summary, because I'm, I'm running out of time, the high-level idea is that omega is a language for, for causal uh, inference, both normal and high-order inference. And what we're really going for here is the question of how can we increase the expressiveness of what we can say in, in probabilistic languages. Um, there are many probabilistic languages. Some are universal in a, kind of, in a similar Turing sense. But there are still things that we want to add to our languages to make them more expressive. And we also want them to be fast and efficient, and this is why we use Julia as the, kind of the, the base language to build them in. Um, things often become very difficult to compute, compute rather. Omega doesn't make that magically not true, but we have a lot of high, you know, highly efficient inference algorithms like HMC and so on and so on to make inference work in at least uh, you know, reasonable size models. And lastly, the question we're talking about now is how can we extend the language even further? What do we want to say in our languages which we can't say now? And I think this is a question that we uh, have more broadly in, in inference and more broadly in languages like Julia and so on. How can we increase the expressi expressiveness of our language? Um, so that's it. Thanks for your time, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I saw one, one there. Yeah, so, so on, the, on the first oh, part, could, could you the so, so the, 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 the question was how do we show, how do we represent independence versus not independence, or maybe you said conditional independence. 
And the second part is what I think of directed acyclic graphs. So the first part, I didn't really show it, but in Omega we have explicit constructs for independence and condition independence. So as I showed you, you, you turn a, a function which takes an RNG or takes an Omega and returns some value. You turn that function into a random variable. But when you turn it into a random variable, you decide basically how you, you decide your choice of independence. And so you would decide, I want this random variable to be conditionally independent given its parent. So we have constructs constructs that basically allow you to express all the things that you would imagine you want to express. Um, and the second part for, uh, for DAGs, you said? Direct, directed yeah, acyclic yeah, or cyclic? Directed acyclic graph. It's a, it's a, um, yeah, like a graphical model, right? Yeah, so a probabilistic program is basically a generalization of a graphical model. So it is, it's strictly more general. Um, but Omega is not the first one to, to, to do this. Yeah, you could model a graphical model in, uh, in Omega, but uh, graphical models have algorithms that are designed to make them very efficient, and we don't have those algorithms implemented. Uh, sure. So you mentioned quickly that uh, training neural networks, for example, are now more efficient to compress data rather than by location. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back. Oops. Yeah, so the first part is, uh, so the actual experiment is that we had a bunch of data from people, the, the glucose data over time. Um, and we wanted to train an RNN to predict from some amount of data the rest of their data. Um, so if you, don't have a lot, if you don't have much data, an RNN fails miserably, right? Because it, basically this is what this kind of squiggly gray line is shown in this plot, right? After a few steps, it just goes off crazily. Um, but talking to people in, in healthcare, because we actually talk to doctors, and they say things like, well, I just have this high-level knowledge that these curves should be similar. My like patient A should be roughly similar to patient B. And with Omega, you basically just encode that information. You say these people should roughly be similar, and you don't get these wild projections in, into time, right? Because it constrains what's possible. Um, and so basically, we just condition on the high-level facts that a doctor would have, and they're things like expectations should be closed, expectations should be bounded, uh, and, and so on. Um, and the kind of the, the, the orange curve is showing a more realistic uh, trajectory with this condition uh, added to it. And the second question was... Uh, model selection using... Um, yeah, so uh, you can encode it. It'll be a hard inference problem. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so we don't... So one question we're, we're thinking about is whether we should have kind of algorithms to help people check these kind of things. We don't have these algorithms implemented, right? Kind of the primitive construct is this replace operator, which basically is just a model of the do operator. In causal, like do is already taken in Julia, so we had to think of a, a different name. Um, but there are many things that people want to do, like identification and so on, which, which are things which we could implement, or at least we should implement, but we, we haven't yet. Um, I think we're sadly going to have to cut it there. So if you have questions, please talk to the speaker afterwards. Uh, but let's thank the speaker again for an excellent talk. Thank you.